In my first three lectures, I talked about technical details that economists typically use. We use supply and demand. It's our workhorse model for talking about the world and for understanding what goes on in markets. But I didn't talk about the applicability of markets, the wide applicability of markets to the world. And that's what this lecture is about. You may have noticed in the title of our lecture today, Sex, Murder, and Reckless Driving, that we're going to be talking a little bit about non-traditional markets. And to get us into that kind of mindset, we need to have, understand a distinction between two types of questions that economics may be. Normative economics goes under the label of questions of what should be. And positive economics goes under the questions of what is. Or what you'd expect to happen. Um, really, they're questions about what actually is going on in the world. And often, when we use economics, this is a tough enough question. Normative questions tend to be more difficult. They rely on, well, self-reflection. We need to know really what exactly uh, we should think about the world, about what actually happens. And so, a lot of times, what we need to know is we need to know about the consequences of the positive questions to really make a good, informed decision. would be, should I have sex? That is a normative question. It's what should be. The positive questions are more precise. They're more easily answerable, and that's kind of why we like them. Um, a positive question about, uh, about sex would be, Will I contract AIDS if I have sex? This question we need to know, understand the motives for asking the question. We need to understand why is it that we're asking, should I have sex? Is it a moral introspective question? Is it a question about how we feel about the consequences? Do we know the consequences when we ask this question? Sometimes it presumes that we know the consequences. And really, we need to have answers for these positive questions in order to understand the normative question of, well, should I have sex? You might be thinking, well, why is this economist here in this Hawaiian shirt talking to me about sex? Is this all of a sudden a weird form of sex education? Well, it turns out that economics can apply to all sorts of different markets. And that's because we have this conception of price that is a very broad conception. If I am someone considering whether or not I want to have sex, I need to think about what I would give up to potentially have sex. Now, most states, I'm not talking here about uh, what I would give up in terms of dollars and cents. In most states, you can't give up dollars and cents, uh, at least legally, uh, to, obtain, uh, to obtain sexual intercourse. In fact, um, that's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm not talking about um, the dollars and cents issue here. I'm talking about how people respond to incentives that they're facing when they make decisions. And when you actually make the decision about whether to have sex, you may actually factor in something like this. You may say to yourself, is this person that I'm contemplating uh, going to bed with, is she or he um, likely to have a disease that will be transmitted to me? What, are the, what is the likelihood that, I, that I'm actually going to engage in, in this activity and contract a, 
contract uh, something that I don't really want to wake up with in the morning. What is the likelihood that, oh, heaven forbid, uh, something goes wrong with whatever birth control methods I use, or if I don't use birth control methods, what's the likelihood that I end up with an unpleasant surprise for the next 18 years? Um, that's, that's a possibility as well. And so, these are questions that you need to be concerned with, and they apply to markets for sex, they apply to markets for murder, and they apply to markets for reckless driving. Now, you might say, markets for murder, murder's not good, that's a very bad thing. If you're thinking that, you're caught up in the normative question. Of course, we all agree, or most of us agree, that what should be is not murder. We should not murder one another. I mean, killing someone is, is a really unjustifiable act. I mean, it's, it's a terrible thing. But, when we want to assess the consequences of providing additional incentives uh, for murderers to stop um, uh, those activities, we need to focus on the question of what is. What are the likely consequences of raising punishments for murderers? Uh, in the short term, in the interim, in, in the long term, uh, what are the consequences if we uh, raise uh, the likelihood of the death penalty? Um, those are all increases in this price. And to the extent that there are people out there for which murder um, is a valued commodity, something that they, that they want to partake in, so, uh, some violent behavior, well, then they're going to respond to this price a la the law of demand. And so if you raise that price in any way, shape, or form, we'd expect a decline in that. And so on our normative basis, once we have solved this positive question, once we have assessed the likely impact of well, increasing the price on this particular good, we can see that we can get a quantity decrease, which most... The idea is that if uh, you have seatbelts, if it's all of a sudden safer for people to, uh, to drive, um, that decreases their price of reckless driving, and you're going to see more of it. If you see more people driving more recklessly, well, that could cause, uh, cause problems in terms of more accidents, a uh, higher likelihood of getting in an accident. And so you can see uh, that there are all sorts of places where we can apply economic reasoning, specifically supply and demand, we just expand our notion of what a price is to what you give up, not just dollars and cents, but really what are the consequences of your actions, and then apply that while thinking about positive questions.